Welcome to GabFest Reads for June 2024. I'm David Plotz, one of the hosts of the Slate Political GabFest. Eddie Bott, what a book. I tore through Sierra Greer's novel, the story of a sex robot or android. I'm, we'll get into the, the terminology in a minute. Named Annie and her growing recognition of her own self, her consciousness. This is not a new theme. It's as old as Frankenstein, as new as Clara and the Sun. But holy moly, this is a gripping book. It is sexy about sex. There's a lot of interesting sex in the sex robot book. And it is deep about what it means to be human. Sierra Greer joins me from her home in I don't even know where, Sierra. Welcome to GabFest Reads. Thank you so much, David. I'm so happy to be here. And I'm connecting with you from Connecticut. Thank you for this joy of a book. I love world building. And I especially love subtle world building. And you do it so well in Anybot. Can you tell me some of the the key features of the world we arrive at where we meet Anybot? What is Stella Handy? What are Cuddle Bunnies and Abigails and Nannies? Well, Anybot is the story of a very advanced female robot named Annie, who's custom designed to be the perfect girlfriend for her human owner, Doug. And he purchases this robot because he's 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 lonely. And there's this company, Stella Handy, that produces uh, companion robots. And they come in three different modes. They can be Abigails to help out around the house and cooking. They can be nannies to take care of people, typically children, but they could be people of any age. And then cuddle bunnies who can provide intimacy. When Doug decides to advance Annie to become autodidactic, at that point, he has to choose one of those three modes to put her in. And he decides to put her in the cuddle buddy mode for the intimacy. And curiously enough, um, in doing that, he makes her not as effective as a robot in terms of cleaning up the house. And he actually really likes to have a clean house too. So he's not able to do that. So that's what that's what the business model is for Stella Handy and how that plays into Doug's life. At Stella Handy, why do you think they settled on those three kinds of models? Oh, Gosh, I guess because those were the things were in the most demand. They were not um, looking for people to be, uh, for robots to be workers or to be leaders of society or to run politics or to do things that um, have a larger impact on a larger world. They were looking for basically domestic uh, domestic personalities to take care of things in the home. And why does the nanny, so nanny does not have it. Well, cuddle bunnies are called cuddle bunnies. Nanny is called nanny. Abigail gets a name. Why does Abigail, the cleaning type, have a name of Abigail? Abigail Abigail uh, used to mean a, a servant. It used to mean a, ma- a maid. That's another really? meaning of the word Abigail, yeah. I did not yeah. know that. It is, it's less clear kind of what kind of male robots there are, but there are male robots. And what, what, what do they do? They actually have the same counterpoint jobs as the females do. And it's true, I don't go into them much in the novel. They don't really figure with any importance, but they exist too. So people who would like to have male versions of the same robots can have them too. The reason that they don't really show up in this novel too is because uh, by having an owner who's male and a robot who's female, it really gets to play out a very familiar scene that that kind of fits into the power dynamics of our society in at large. So they kind of have a one-on-one version of a larger patriarchal patriarchal society. So that's why I chose that. So as you say, at the, at the beginning of, of uh, Annie Bot, Doug has put, he's put Annie, he's put his Stella into autodidact mode. So what is happening to Annie as she is in autodidact mode that makes it different from what she was when, when she came out of the factory? Well, she's started to really learn things on her own. And at the beginning, uh, she she needs a lot of extra patience because she's not used to doing things on her own. She's used to strictly following commands. And she's supposed to be able to learn to have more independence and do things on her own. Um, he likes it. Doug likes it when she starts acting more human. But that also makes things more complicated for her because having more human qualities means she's more curious and she has longings and she's interested in trust and deceit and lying. So she becomes a person who, uh, she still has to please him. Her number one programming is to please her owner. And yet, so she's divided because she's supposed to please him by becoming human, but by becoming human, she 
is not always pleasing him. So it, it sets up a real conflict for her and for them both. She has the, this flesh, this very sophisticated fleshly uh, covering. And she can, you know, she she presents very much as a human to somebody who just meets her on the street. This book is told, it's not told from Annie's perspective directly, but it's an omniscient third person perspective that is very much in Annie's consciousness. What is the satisfaction that she is getting for meeting Doug's needs? How is a robot feeling satisfaction? I think for her, a lot of the time, it's a lack of pain because when she does displease him, it's acutely uncomfortable for her. She judges his displeasure on a scale of zero to 10. And as soon as he gets to one, she starts to be uneasy. And when she gets, he gets to five, that's really uncomfortable for her. So as soon as he gets off of zero, she has to try to figure out ways to make him happier again. I guess what I mean, what do you think that discomfort is for a machine? Like we're going to have the machines that are something like that. What, how is the machine feeling that? Yeah, I, I think it would be hard for Annie to express that in a way because she's a mean, a hu- she's a machine and we only understand things that are described to us for human feelings. So you have to find what you consider to be a human feeling and then find a parallel for that for a machine. So I, I'm not sure how to answer that any better than to say she has a machine version of human dis- uh, human discomfort or human pain. One of the things you do well is you talk about the, the battery as a constant source. It's a constant subject in the book. And and. There's a sense that when she's working hard, when she's mentally working hard, she is draining her battery faster than she was when she wasn't mentally working hard. Yeah, she's turning through. She turns through her battery, like because she has to use more memory and more power to contemplate things that are difficult. So Doug is a really interesting person because he's lonely, he's bitter, he's abusive, he's vindictive, but he's also full of love and pathos. Um, is he pathetic for wanting to have a cuddle bunny, for wanting to have a robot companion? Well, this is the problem. I think he is aware that he is pathetic. I think he feels ashamed of having her, and yet he's chosen to have her to try to solve his problem of his loneliness. So he, too, is really caught in this strange place. But, you know, the, the solution he's tried to find for his problem actually exacerbates his problem. So, yeah, I think he's, I think he's sort of pathetic and sad. One of the things that I think is so good about Anybot is that you recognize something that's really important about AI, which I, I, I can't stand most of the conversation about AI today because it seems to me that large language models are not like, it's not AI. It's not, it's, it isn't meaningful intelligence. It's not meaningfully interacting with the world. And you're, I think over and over again, you make the point that in, that humanness is embodied, that to, for Annie to be a increasingly human, it's not something that happens mentally to her. It's something that happens physically in relationship to human beings and to the world. It's to, it's to literally touching things, seeing things, experiencing things. There's no mind body separation. Like she, her, her, her humanness is, is wrapped up in her physical self too, right? Absolutely. And I, I think that's one of the reasons that the novel is actually pretty far away from our reality because we don't have the biotechnology at all right now to create somebody who's like Annie. We have AI companions that you can have um, just online through a phone or through a FaceTime sort of situation. I heard just the other day on Hard Fork that 3.5 million people have AI companions through their computers or their, their telephones at this point. So you can have like the psychological or emotional, well, is it emotional? You can have the intellectual side of a companion through a com- computer and they're not super advanced yet, but they exist. Um, but to create somebody like Annie, you, we can't do yet. And yet we want to play around with this idea because people see it coming. And also it's just really intriguing to think, well, what would you do with this creature who seems really human, but is also a machine? And and when does she seem more human and less machine? And what are responsibilities to somebody like that? And then is it right to control somebody who is as sentient as Annie seems to be? Is it right to control someone who is as sentient as Annie seems to be? I don't think it is. I don't think so at all. I think I think as soon as she's thinking for herself, I don't know what kind of existence is available to her, but to have her completely controlled by somebody else who can turn her off or turn her on at a whim, I think that's really unhealthy and 
unfair. I think that's really unfair. It's hard to imagine a world where we leave future generations with fewer rights and freedoms. The Supreme Court has stolen the constitutional right to control our bodies. Now politicians in nearly every state have introduced bills that would block people from getting the essential sexual and reproductive care they need, including abortion. Planned Parenthood believes everyone deserves access to care. It's a human right. We won't give up and we won't back down. Help ensure the next generation can decide their own futures. Donate to Planned Parenthood. Visit plannedparenthood.org slash future. There's a lot of sex in this book, which I, I was going to give it to one of my kids. And I was like, do I want to give this book to one of my kids? It's, there's a lot of sex in it. There's a lot of robot sex. Why did you have so much sex in the book? No, the sex is actually a really integral part of the relationship between them. I didn't think it would be right to just close the door so that we couldn't see it when things are going on. Um, sex is... Uh, it's this really intimate, important part of what happens between them. And a lot of their power dynamics actually are shown in the sex. So sometimes it seems to be more consensual. Sometimes uh, she's servicing him in a way that is supposed to um, distract him from things or to prove her subservience or prove that he has control. And yet on the other hand, he desires her very, very much So in a way, she has power over him because she knows how much he desires her. So it's actually really complex. So the sex has to actually, it really has to be there. And I don't feel that the novel goes on graphically forever with the sex. It's not, it doesn't, I don't think it falls into pornography. And yet I don't, I don't just pretend it's not there either. I really, I really do go for it. Yeah. No, and it's, it's, it's clear. And especially when the, you know, other You know, there's one other male character who interacts vividly with Annie. It's like clear how much sex when people see her and encounter her and think of her as a, oh, she's a cuddle bunny that it gets them all. Everyone's excited about this idea and you, you want to represent that. Yeah. So do you believe in the world that you created? Do you think that we are going to have creatures like Annie one day? Not really soon. Um, But I don't think we need to have creatures like Annie to encounter the problems that Annie poses, because I think emotionally we are going to have characters or people that we can create, or I don't even know how to say it. We're going to have AI companions that will be really important to us. And on the flip side, we already have humans now who are treated like they are objects. So the same issues that show up in the novel between a robot and human are happening now between human and human So I think the novel really is an allegory for what's happening now. So we don't have to look to the future and the technology. We can look to how this is a mirror for what's happening between people now. Yes. I mean, it's certainly when you think about, you read stories about how people treat domestic servants or how people treat people who've been sex trafficked, there is this, you know, sickness and, and sadness in that. And which certainly, yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't, I'm too stupid to have thought about it as an allegory for that. I was only thinking about the future, not the present. Ah, this is interesting. I'm not sure what this, what this says about you. Hmm. It's curious, right? I've had really different reactions to this novel. If I can just kind of jump in here, I'm not completely surprised that that didn't occur to you. When um, my, my editor was talking to me about, the potential she saw for this novel, she said, we really needed to cast the net in a lot of different directions to people that would not necessarily always overlap. So the book has been reviewed in in things you wouldn't always think about together. It's been in Scientific American and it's been in Glamour and it's been in the New York Times. So, and it's been in newsletters for tech people out in San Francisco. So there are a lot of ways that, that people, audiences don't necessarily overlap. That and they yet they can come to this novel and sort of bring themselves to it. I've had really um, strongly emotional letters from women who have been in relationships that were abusive, and they're pretty grateful that I'm helping them feel seen. I guess that's the way to put it. And men too. I've written. I've heard from men too who have been in coercive relationships, and they just 
are grateful that someone is is bringing these to light. So that's going on. And at the same time, I know that there are some people who really would welcome the idea of having women or, or versions of women that are very simplified and uh, have a very strict uh, set of rules that they're supposed to exist within because that would make the men feel more comfortable around them. So there are really a lot of ways for people to talk about this novel. The, I was struck I, just before we got on, I was just Googling the, the book just to see, oh, is there something I missed about it? And and I was struck at how many, how the word abusive shows up again and again in the sort of the the reviews by by readers, that there are people who who either are saying, oh, you know, you should be aware that this portrays of an abusive relationship. You should be, if you're, you, if that's something that that's difficult for you to read about, you should be careful reading this. And then other people saying how well this portrays an abusive relationship. You should read that because it does it. And, uh, but I, as I said, like I was, you know, because I'm, I'm, uh, I guess just interested in speculative fiction was only thinking about the future and not really worrying about that part of it. But now I'm ashamed. Oh. Uh, so it goes. No. <laughs> Uh, so who who are you reading uh, that GabFest listeners should also be reading right now? I tend to read novels, and I really liked How High We Go in the Dark by Sequoia Nagamatsu, which is another speculative story or novel that, that works where each chapter almost serves as a, its own short story, and yet they build together and they, they go across a very broad timeline. So it, it's just sort of a... I don't know, it's just sort of a dazzling book. I really liked that. There's another novel by Francis Cha called If I Had Your Face, and it's set in Korea. And there are five different women characters that are part of an industry there where they have to have um, they have to have facial cosmetic surgery in order to appear beautiful for their jobs. And that's it just was sort of it seemed like the future to me. And then I started reading more about it and realizing actually a lot of the surgery is happening now. So that novel really startled me. Those are those are two of my favorites lately. And what are you working on now? Is is the world of is Annie's world going to continue? Are you going to explore what it likes to be it is to be a handy or or some other perspective on that world? Or have you moved on to something else? You know, I am really, really drawn back into this world with Annie. Um, but to be honest, I've started going off with it in, in several different directions and none of them yet has been the right one to continue all the way into the length of a novel. Uh, it's really, it's just really intriguing to imagine what would happen to Annie herself directly afterward. So I've started that, I've started that novel in about three different directions and I've tried combining versions of that. They're just not, they just don't work right now. You know what it is? There's so much drive in Annie Bot, and it's sort of her origin story. So for me, it was really, really powerful. Um, I've tried to jump ahead with Doug ahead five years to see where he is. I've tried to follow some of the parallel characters that they're, that show up briefly in the novel or who are implied by the novel. So I'm definitely playing around with the world, but I haven't found the right tack. And I think it it's okay to just, I'm just going to take my time with this. And and not rush. And if just if the right combination of ideas comes together, I'm going to follow them. And if it doesn't come together, I'm going to keep exploring other ideas too. I do a lot of brainstorming. I write, I write every day, um, and I consider that a win, even if it doesn't add up to something that could eventually be a novel. Sierra Greer's novel is so good. It is Annie Bot. It is uh, it's fun. It's dark. It's light. It's uh, it really will make you think. I, I, as I said, I like tore through it. Tore, tore, tore through it. I stayed up way later than I normally would just because I I needed to keep going. And it. it's such a good book. Sierra, thank you for joining us on Gap Fest Reads. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you very much. That's it for this month's edition of GapFest Reads. Our producer, Shana Roth. Ben Richmond is Senior Director of Operations for Slate Podcasts. Alicia Montgomery is Vice President of Audio for Slate. We'll be back next month with another edition of GapFest Reads. Until then, John and Emily and I will be back with you on Thursday with a new episode of the Slate Political GapFest. <laughs>